Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Before we begin uh, with asking a couple of questions for Professor Smart, just some housekeeping errors. First of all, uh, to convey to the court and to the, everyone else that I spent some time over uh, uh, last night um, revisiting and this, uh, the timing of my questioning. And I'm doing my best and uh, hope to shorten the um, time that I will need uh, especially after having the opportunity to discuss questions with my co uh, with uh, counsel for the group of seven. So let's hope for the best. Very good. The second housekeeping matter is that yesterday we discussed uh, by agreement handing up renewing nature's wealth, which was found in compendium V.2 at pages 38 and following at tab 16. And by agreement, uh, I would just have that marked as the next exhibit, which I understand is 71. So is, um, what is this, an excerpt from an article? Yes, this is an excerpt from an article. And you might remember that I took Professor Smart to pages 196 and 197 when we were discussing uh, where reforestation was going on in Norfolk, Prince Edward County, Sault Ste. Marie, and the like. All right. And oh, sorry, I just wanted to say it's a book, not an article. Oh, thank you. It's, it's an excerpt of a book. And uh, the in, it's described in the index of volume two at tab 16. And I will read out how it's described. Uh, but before that, is it already um, in the joint book of documents? Uh, parts of parts of it are already in the joint book of documents. That's but not this part. Yes, uh, chapters two and eighteen of this publication are already in the record, as exhibit one hyphen four six six one hyphen five three two seven five three two eight five three two nine and five three eight seven. Yes. And uh, so these are just Additional. excerpts that uh, the witness had referenced in his slide deck, in his uh, demonstratives, and that uh, we thought should be in the record. And we asked him about it. And it was described at tab 16 as excerpt of Richard Lambert, comma, Renewing Nature's Wealth, Ontario, the Department of Lands and Forests, 1967, Excerpt of chapter 10, pages 196 and 197. And it has been um, referenced as the Lambert and Cross? Y yes. I'm just going to Okay, thank you. Thank you. And you, you say that this is at, or from vol, uh, tab 16, volume two of your compendium? That's or correct. Is, yes? Th that's, that's where it originally was, and that's where you will find it. Thank you. Pages 38 and following of tab 16. You're good. Huh? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Good morning, Professor Smart. Good morning. I, I, I'm hoping that I don't have too many more questions for you. We'll see how it goes. Um, I noted when I looked at your demonstratives that 
you included in the demonstrative, your demonstratives from uh, the odd time, you included in demonstratives from um, Mr. Hutchings' slide deck. Is that correct? Yes. Sorry? Yes. Um, so prior <coughs> to testifying today, did you review his slide deck? Sorry, repeat the question. I caught. Prior to testifying uh, in this case, did you review his slide deck? Yes. And yesterday you had indicated that on the double counting issue, you didn't understand his concerns because he, you had, he, you had indicated he was, as far as you understood, looking at line 54. Yes. Now, I want to show you a part of exhibit 11, which is part of his slide deck. Do you have a copy of it in front of you? Yes. So this is what Mr. Hutchings had in his slide deck. And you can see the very same issue is an issue with the zeros or inclusions, not at row 54, but 52 and 57 and comparing it to 55 and 56, which is the exact same issue we discussed yesterday. I'm gonna to suggest to you that you perhaps just missed this. I think I did. I think I skipped over this section of Mr. Hutchings slide decks, believing the issue to be resolved. Thank you. I, I was handed up a sheet of paper just now called excerpt of exhibit 11. Uh, yes, that's is that what, what you were just, looking at? That's exactly what we were just looking at. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, uh, Professor Smart, I wonder if we could turn to, um, let's see if I included it in the, I'm looking for pages uh, 12. Um, yes, tab 23 of the compendium. So at tab 23 of the compendium, we have an excerpt um, of your uh, report. Um, let's see. Excerpt of Robin Bodwe and Michael Sparks, Sir Reply to Joseph Stiglitz and David Hutchings, pages 12 and 13. It's part of that exhibit was exhibit 64. And I have a couple questions to ask you about paragraphs uh, 27 and following, if you, if you don't mind. So the first thing I want to ask you about is the use of um, what you identified as the rational expectations hypothesis. Do you recall talking about that? Yes. And in paragraph 28, you say our approach, and this is in the middle of the document, the middle of par paragraph 28, um, our approach relies on the simple idea that the revenues that were actually collected are the best available evidence about the revenues that an impartial party could have expected in 1850. And I'm going to put it to you, sir, that using the rational expectation hypothesis on the facts as known in this case is uh, not appropriate. Would you agree with that? I don't agree.
would you agree with me that the rational expectation hypothesis is one that is properly intended for macroeconomics, not individual cases? No, I don't. Although I do think that the term is used in different ways within the economics literature, because it's a, a useful and a widely applied concept. And I'm using it only in one particular sense that economists use it. Would you agree with me that the rational expectation hypothesis says nothing about people having crystal balls? Yes. Thank you. Would you agree with me that applying the rational expectation hypothesis as you have used it, if you had asked that question and done your work as at 1950, what the parties would have expected would have been the outcome in 1950 when there was a positive NCRR amount. Is that correct? Well, Mr. Schachter, you've just applied a different hypothesis, which economists call the adaptive expectations hypothesis. Adaptive meaning that people would update their beliefs about the future based on what they have seen in the recent past. So the model of expectations that you describe is used within the economics profession, but it's not the one that we use. We use an alternative view, which is not that people have a crystal ball, but that their guesses are pretty good on average. They don't make consistent errors in their expectations. That's what we assume. I'm gonna to suggest to you, sir, that the proper use of that hypothesis is that when you don't know the future, um, you can use that to forecast what might happen in the future. That's a, um, a model you might use. Would you agree with that? Not sure. Okay. I'm not sure what that is. You just clarified. All right. Maybe I'll put it this way. It is wrong to use the hypothesis, the rational expectation hypothesis, when you know what the party, what actually happened. You don't use that hypothesis when you know what actually happened. It depends on who you think you is in your question. All right. Uh, the Anishinaabe in 1850 uh, would not be using a rational expectation hypothesis, uh, uh, would they? The rational ex expectations hypothesis is an assumption made by a researcher such as myself in order to understand the beliefs and expectations of other parties, including parties in the generally, typically, parties that we observe their behavior at some time in the past, and we're trying to understand what they think is going to happen in their future. But we have applied to that. Please go ahead. No, 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 I don't want to interrupt you. I, I, I thought you were done. We have applied that in thinking about the beliefs and expectations of the crown officials in 1850. We could apply it, I believe, to the Anishinaabe treaty parties as well, because we're trying to model basic human belief formation, but we did not apply it to the Anishinaabe. Would you agree with me that if this court case had happened in 1950, the results of what you say the Crown understood in 1850 would be different? I don't agree for the simple reason that under our approach, what happens after 1950 has very little impact on our estimate of the value of augmentation. No, that's not the question I asked. I'm asking about NCRRs. Sorry, could you repeat the question? If you had asked your question in 1850 about what the Crown expected in 1850, looking back from a from the date 1950 the results of your ncrr calculation would have been different 
they would not have been substantially different. Recall that we're trying to estimate the value that parties in 1850 would have placed on NCRs. We use the risk-adjusted present value concept of which one component of our model is the rational expectations hypothesis you're asking me about now. We use that hypothesis only to motivate our risk-adjusted present value in 1850. I'm sorry, I didn't ask you how, if the difference was large or small, I asked you if there'd be a difference. It would be different. Thank you. Now, I've included in at uh, the compendium page 67, at page 13 of your report, and uh, at paragraph 30, and you moot the question at paragraph 30, would the First Nations have accepted a promise of 1% 170 years later? And you answer your rhetorical question, yes. Right at the beginning of page 30. Uh, uh, sorry, paragraph 30, not page 30, I apologize. So paragraph 30, would the First Nations, FNs, that's First Nations, have accepted a promise of 1% 170 years later? Your answer is yes. And, and do you stand by that answer? But first, ask for some context. These are our words, but we've written many. Is this our sir reply to Professor Stiglitz and Mr. Hutchings of December? Yes. That would explain, yes. All right, thank you. So do I stand by this statement? Yes, I do. And so in your interpretation, uh, your best economic model that you can come up with is one where the Anishinaabe maybe scratched their heads, looked at, uh, ex looked at what might happen in the future and said, yep, 170 years later, we're okay with 1%. That's your, that's your conclusion, sir? Well, the specifics, of course, we do not think parties in 1850 were haggling about percentage points of sharing, but the question was asked to us in the reply report, so we responded in this manner. What we mean in general is that parties in 1850 were not placing a lot of weight in their valuations and their thinking on what would happen 170 years later. Again, it's a basic, in our opinion, an economist's opinion, basic human characteristic to place less weight on things they will get in the future and things they will get today, particularly if those future things are highly uncertain. And that's what our model captures. And I believe it's a realistic depiction of how people would have been thinking in 1850. They, they didn't know about what would happen in 2019 and they didn't waste a lot of time thinking. Louder, is that what you asked? Louder, Sorry. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna to suggest to you there's no basis in the documentary record to support the, uh, your opinion that the First Nations would have accepted a promise of 1% 170 years later. Do you agree with that? Yes, but I do need to qualify that. I don't believe the 1850 negotiations were around percentages year by year. And so therefore, there is no documentary evidence to support that. We were not suggesting that they would. We were responding to Stiglitz and Hutchins. Um, I've included in at uh, Um, tab 29, an article, uh, a, a copy of a speech by the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada in 2011. Um, have you ever heard of a fellow by the name of Jean Boisvoin? Yes. Who is he? He's an economist. And he, at, I don't know if he's still at the Bank of Canada. Do you know? I don't. 
but he, you do know that at one time he was the deputy governor of the Bank of Canada. Yes, I know it now. Okay, so I want to take you through just some things that uh, at least this economist was of the view of. And he was giving a speech, it looks to the Canadian Association for Business Economics on August 23, 2011. And the title is How People Think and How It Matters. And at the bottom of the first page, um, at page 86 of the compendium tab 29, he says, my goal today is to paint a portrait of the uncertainty we have about how expectations are formed and discuss the implications for two current policy questions the desirability of price level targeting and the implications of financial imbalances for monetary policy. So he's looking at matters on a macro level. Would you agree? Yes. And over on the second page of his article, at page, I guess it's 87 of the compendium under the heading, why are expectations so important for monetary policy? And in the third paragraph, he, his speech contains the following. The future is inherently uncertain. Would you agree with that? That the future is uncertain? Yes. He continues, firms, individuals, family, and policymakers, all of us form best guesses or expectations regarding events we are uncertain about. Would you agree with that? I would ask you, where are we? I know we don't have numbered paragraphs. Can you? It, it, I, I said the third paragraph, and I've tried to highlight it for you. Got it. On, on the monitor. I'm on, I'm on paper. It's easier to read. Thanks. Yeah. Um, just quickly, then. Would you agree with the third paragraph on the second page of his? Yes, speech? I do. Okay. Thank you. And in the fourth paragraph, he writes at the last sentence, People will be right or wrong about the future, but what matters to their decisions today is their perception of it. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. And if we could go over to page three of his article, under the heading decision making and expectation formation, which you'll find at page 88 of the compendium. The second paragraph, um, sorry, the first paragraph of, of that section is, so we know that expectations are crucial, but what would, do we know about how they are formed? And he, he then gives this, says this, Trying to understand better how we think is a timeless quest, spanning numerous disciplines such as philosophy, psychology, biology, neuroscience, and political science, as well as economics. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. And would you agree with me that what you can help the court with is the input of an economist to that? Uh, question? That's where my expertise lies. Um, he then continues, these all offer different perspectives and the picture that emerges confirms in some ways the obvious. Decision making is an extremely complex process. Would you agree with that? Yes. Would you agree that that extremely complex process existed in 1850? Yes. Go to the next page of his article at page 89 of the compendium, page four of his speech. And I, I um, he, this is where he gets into rational expectations. He, re, he says, or talks, and he says, so what's an econo economist to do? How do we form a view of how people think? And then he says, a useful starting point has been rational expectations. As the name states, it's based on the optimistic assumption that people are sophisticated, are 
as sophisticated as they can possibly be, hyphen, that they fully understand how economies and markets work, comma, take into account all the information available, comma, fully appreciate the future consequences of their actions today, comma, and make decisions that are fully consistent with this understanding. Do you agree with those statements? I don't agree that all of those statements characterize the rational expectations hypothesis as we have used it. Okay. Um, what is different about the way you use it? We take it to mean people's guesses about the future are right on average. Mr. Boivin here, professor, Boivin is, um, is making some that assumption plus some additional ones, as you can see from the sentence you read. Um, you just used it, made an interesting comment that people's assumptions are right on average. You can't look at one instance and say they're right. You need to look at an average of many, many people in society to have that hypothesis hold true. Would you agree? To make it precisely true, we could, because people are only right on average in any given instance, even averaging over many people's expectations, they're still gonna be wrong a little bit most of the time. But the point is, is that it's a macroeconomic device that when you're looking at not just one instance, but all of uh, a, a larger group of a larger cohort, you need a larger cohort to have a, uh, to be able to say that on average people will be right, correct? That is largely correct. The more people we average over, the closer their average expectations will be to what actually transpires according to our rational, yes. Thank you, sir. Now, the next paragraph sort of is what kind of sort of just stuck, uh, stuck with me as, as, as a, what, how do you call it? Uh, um, a common sense, it, at least to me, it seemed like common sense. The author writes, or he, he spoke and said, taken at fa face value, this might look like a completely crazy idea. The mere fact that we, have, that we economists have jobs and think we play a useful role contradicts rational expectations. After all, if everyone was so sophisticated in their understandings of how the economy works, why would the world need us? Now, I haven't asked a question yet, but it, it's, would you agree with me that what he's mooting is, why do we need economists if everyone can perfectly predict the future? I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of what I think he's saying. Would you agree? I completely agree. The world needs more economists. <laughs> <laughs> Disagree. If I said agree, I disagree. <laughs> you disagree with, um, um, I, I, I know it's a little bit in jest and it's, it, yeah, no. it's, it's nice to have a little levity. That's fine. Um, but uh, in all seriousness though, um, I, do you agree with me that what he's trying to communicate is how could this hypothesis make any sense or be of any use? Because if it's true that people can predict the future, why, would, why do we need economists such as yourself? Would you agree that's what he's trying to communicate? I'm not asking you to defend it at all. I, I don't agree, I'm sorry. Again, I wanna make a distinction between our simple idea that people's guesses about the future are right on average and the extreme ways that that idea could be applied. And Professor Boivin is talking about an extreme version of this hypothesis, which is that if people are good about guessing about everything that will happen in the future and that they will understand how that should affect how they should behave today. And they understand how the changes in their behavior today will affect the future, which in turn affects what their expectations of the future should be. You can see, right, here comes the crazy idea that we could then you know, just iterate over this forever and ever, and then the expectations will drive every outcome that happens in the future. That idea 
called by macroeconomists the rational expectations hypothesis, is different and more extreme than the simple idea that we're working with. And it leads to the conclusion, which Mr. Boivin here is concerned about, that therefore the Bank of Canada can't control the inflation rate or the overall evolution of the economy. Because if people are rational in that extreme sense that he is describing, then they will not only know what the future inflation rate is, but they will know what the bank will do in the future, and they will act preemptively to forestall the bank's actions. That's Mr. Boivin's concerns. They need not concern us here, in my opinion. Thank you. All right. I, I thank you for your opinion there. Um, I'm going to read you one more excerpt of this because I think it's apt to your hypothesis. Um, the, this uh, individual from the Bank of Canada, uh, in, in a couple of paragraphs later, um, says the insights about um, rational expectation um, have proven to be powerful. And he discusses it in terms of a macro level of monetary policy and inflation targeting, uh, identifies it in the paragraph above as crude and simplistic. And then he says this, but rational expectations should come with warning labels, handle with care, keep away from children. The concept was never meant to be taken literally and never should be. I'm going to stop there. Would you agree that that is an apt warning that should come with your use of the rational expectation hypothesis in this case? Not in this case, because we use the rational expectations hypothesis to mean simply expectations of the future are right on average. And it's a reasonable starting point for an econometrician modeling beliefs in the past. He's talking about something else. Yeah, again, I'm not asking you to defend or repeat your testimony. I'm, I'm asking whether I'm you sorry. agree with the statement. Could you repeat the question and- No, and no, you, you answered it. You just uh, went on to defend yourself. I appreciate that advice and I, I am trying to do that. Thank you. Okay. He then continues and says, while useful for some policy issues, it, referring to the rational expectation hypothesis, it can be a very misleading assumption for others. Would you agree with that statement? Not in the context of this case and the way we use the term. Uh, I'd like to turn, if I could, to another subject uh, about the uh, your slides 104 to 106. So if you could get your slides 104 to 106. This is part of your section four, interest rates and present value. And as you've indicated to arrive at a present value, nominal amounts need to be compounded at some interest rate, correct? Yeah, yes. And the compound interest rate compensates for the time value of lost money lost opportunity to spend or invest funds not received in the past. Yes. And um, have you served on the board of an endowment fund? No. Have you served on the board of a trust fund that invests in equities? Yes, but only briefly some years ago. Did they only invest in bonds or did they invest in, they invested in equities, why? I don't, it was a small fund. I don't believe we invested in anything other than bank accounts and certificates of deposit. So what was the investment the criteria of that fund? Were it, was it a long-term hold or short-term? What was the money needed for? You are testing the limits of my memory of 20 years ago. And I don't have enough knowledge now of what those funds look like. Okay. Maybe I can get it, get to my question yeah. this way. Does it matter when one's considering the investments to make how long they plan on holding the investment? Yeah, 
if by holding the investment you mean that there would be no requirement for payment out of those funds, yes, use of those funds in in day to day business, then yes, that would make a difference. And the longer period you can leave your capital invested the more likely you are to invest in equities. Would you agree with that? No. If one knew one needed funds at a particular date in the future, say the date of one's retirement, then an equity investment could be very risky because the market could fall on that day where you need your funds, and, and even that's if it's why, far in the future. And that's why people uh, invest in uh, a portion in equities and a portion in uh, bonds. Is that right? Yes, some people do. Right. Uh, I, it, because um, I'm looking at your slide 106, prudent long-term investors will hold parts of their portfolio in safe bonds and part in other assets, e.g. stocks. That's what a prudent investor would, uh, a long-term investor would do. Yes, that's what we recommend that people do. Thank you. And what, in your view, is a long-term investor? An investor who doesn't need those funds at a specific date and can tolerate losses over a period of time of uncertain length. Now, is there, a, an, uh, like I said, a 10-year term? Uh, can you put it down to uh, uh, temporally is it a, can you say a long-term investor is anyone over 10 years over 50 years over 100 years you know, most people don't live to be 100 100 so i think it's probably less than 100 but what do you are you able to give us a a, a time value instead of a theoretical construct no i i, I don't I'm going to pause for a second just to see if I understand what you're asking. Everyone invests for the long term. If one knew that one didn't need to call on those funds in any way for 10 years and one had no concerns about losses over 10 years, then that would be sufficient to suggest in investing in equities in some degree would be a good idea, I think. That seems reasonable. So. 10 years in that sense of you wouldn't worry about losses and the, the fact that your funds had declined in value over a period of 10 years, that would, that would probably prudently lead one to think that some portion of the, the portfolio should be in something like stocks or something risky. And, and why do prudent investors invest in stocks? They have higher average returns, but those returns are riskier. Thank you. And would you agree with me that the, long, the longer the investment horizon that a person or an entity or investor has, the more prudent it would be to hold a greater portion of their portfolio in equities? I don't think I can go that far. I'm thinking of our standard model. And it, it doesn't have the structure that would allow me to give an answer. Uh, um, you're not a financial advisor, I take it. No, I'm thinking of the academic model oh. of savings and investment decisions of individuals. Okay. And it, it's not amenable to answering the specific question. Would you be you able to answer this question? If there was an institutional investor who wanted to invest for seven generations, say 150 years, um, you wouldn't expect that prudent investor to invest solely in bonds, would you? Beginning from today in the institutions and expectations we have today, if there was no need to call on funds for seven generations, I would recommend investing in equities to some degree. And I appreciate you're not an investment advisor, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, now, in direct testimony, you suggested that the bond rate is 
appropriate for the Anishinaabe in this case because it's offset. The, the, the greater return on equities is offset by the greater risk of losses and the transactional costs of holding the equities. Do you recall that? Is that a fair a statement of uh, re re restatement of what you said? I think so, yes. Now, now, you included in that transactional cost peace of mind. Do you remember that? Don't specifically recall that, but I understand that term. Yes. Did, 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 was that a mistake or did you really mean to say that? Exposure to risk, in my view, leads to a loss of peace of mind. And so in evaluating the cost of holding a risky portfolio, one should recognize one will have less peace of mind. That's what I probably meant when I used that term in my testimony, I think. Would you agree with me that if your proposition is correct, that that people are rational and seek to avoid risk and um, the cost of the transactional costs take away the added gain? And again, you, you spoke from the perspective of the Anishinaabe. Um, would you agree with me that no one would ever invest in equities because they'd get no net benefit from him, from the risk. Do you agree with that? No. No. They would get no, in our standard model, they would get no net benefit from investing more in equities than the level that the market participants hold on average. By market participants, you mean people who invest in equities in the market? People who invest with similar objectives and over a similar horizon, they're gonna hold some, right? So we talk about the market portfolio as representing the aggregate of all the assets that people invest in. And the statement I was trying to make is that the first few dollars you invest in equities, you're earning higher returns, your exposure to risk is relatively small. So that's a good idea. But the more you invest in equities, the more risk you're exposed to, the more that loss of peace of mind is relevant to how you should evaluate it. And so uh, the risk adjusted return falls the more you invest. So once you get to about the average of what people are doing overall in the market, you've reached a point of no further returns to more equity investment. The extra, the higher average return you're getting on that stock purchase you make is fully offset by the additional risk you're exposing yourself to. So, but, but your answer that you just gave me is after looking at it on a risk adjusted basis. I heard those words from you. Well, maybe I want we're, to be maybe we're talking at cross purposes here. No, no, well, I, I understand you perfectly. I, I just want to be cautious that we use the various economic experts use the terms risk adjustment and risk premium in two different but related ways. And we should all be cautious. So in this context, we're talking about the time value of money to the Anishinaabe if they had received funds in the past, what would they have done? What returns would they have earned? And, and so in this context, there is a risk premium in stock returns that Mr. Hutchings invokes. And I'm saying that risk premium is offset by risk costs, which must be taken into account. I just wanna point out that's quite different, even though it employs similar concepts to the discussion you and I just had, sir, about risk adjusted present value. So I wanna be cautious, but I'm with you. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad we had that clarification because we're not a, on the same page. I'm talking about risk premium and risk cost. And I'm suggesting to you that if you, you testified indirect that the Anishinaabe would achieve no benefit from the risk premium in equities. That's the gist of your testimony. 
Do you agree that that's what you said? Yes. And I'm going to suggest to you that um, that statement is incorrect. Would you agree with that? I think it's by and large correct. The first investments one makes in equities earn higher returns. They are more risky, but as long as it's a small part of your portfolio, that's a good idea. And so you will experience a gain from that. But only up to the point where the market at that point, the aggregation of all similar people is investing in such risky assets. So we have to look at how much people are actually investing at that time in such risky assets. And then, uh, right, so there is some risk, even in say, say people invested 10% in equities. Let's suppose they invested 60% in equities. Well, I guess I have to, because you're leading this examination. Fine, 60. It's harder for me to think about that, but I'll try. Um, it's just a number. Well, numbers is my department and it'll be less accurate, but I can still do it with 60. So we would probably think, well, a good approximation is the first 30%, the excess returns were, a good, were, were valuable to you. But the next 30%, they were probably completely washed out by the overall risk. So if the market was investing 60% in equities, it might be appropriate to say 30% that when it comes to determining the net risk adjusted value of such investments, we will count 30% or one half of the amount that the market was investing in equities, which under your hypothesis is 60. If it was 10% that the market was investing in equities, we might want to count 5% of the risk premium of equity returns and everything else, we would use the risk, risk-free risk rate of return. And, so, and, and would you at least agree with me that the diminishing returns of risk are, and the peace of mind factor that you're factoring in depends on the particular circumstances and risk tolerance of the individual person or institution making the investment? Yes. Thank you. I, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm left with this proposition, which I wonder if you agree with. Uh, I'm gonna suggest to you, sir, that you have rejected the 60-40 bring forward calculations of Stiglitz and Hutchings because of the large numbers that results when compared to bringing it forward on the basis of bonds. And it's the result that drove your conclusion, not a uh, proper economic model. Would you agree? No, I don't. I just use the standard technique among economists. Let's, uh, thank you, sir. Um, let's use, uh, let's um, move if we could to bond rates. Now you'll remember in your testimony, there was a little bit of a disagreement um, between you and Mr. Hutchings about what bond rates to use between the period 1900 and 1913. Now let's go to your slide 109 to 112. Now, in these slides, you suggest that Mr. Hutchings erred in utilizing provincial government bonds for the years 1900 to 1913. Is that correct? Yes. And you say he should have used Dominion bonds in pound sterling denominations for that year? Those years, excuse me. Yes. Now at slide 111, you 
put in quotation marks um, and you reference Mr. Hutchings' academic research and academic research in quotation marks at slide 111. And you say that the academic research that he relied on recommends the use of Ontario yields where Dominion's, Canada's, were not available. And you say, see next slide. And you included a paragraph from a book from Homer and Scylla <coughs> on slide 112. See that? Yes. Um, and you say at the bottom of slide 111, it is possible that Mr. Hutchings did not read the table carefully and failed to notice um, that the advice to use Ontario returns did not apply during 1900 to 1913. Um, that's your assertion. Uh, is it uh, possible, sir, that Mr. Hutchings was correct and you were wrong and you did not read the article correctly? I don't think so. Did you review the Homer and Scylla textbook references before arriving at your um, uh, that proposition that perhaps Mr. Hutchings was wrong? I don't think this is a textbook, but yes, I did read the book. You don't think it's a textbook? What, what kind of book is it? I think this issue came up before. It's a book called A History of Interest Rates. Textbook would mean an authoritative thing that we give to students to teach them about economics. All it's right. not that. So we have at trial exhibit 1-2125, which you will find in the compendium volume two at tab 26. A copy of the 2005 edition, I think you looked at a, an earlier edition from 19, um, at, at least looking at your slide, it looks like you looked at a 1977 edition, uh, whereas um, the one in the trial record is um, from 2005. Are, are you aware if there's any differences? Because I didn't find any. Yes, I examined them both. They are the same. Yes, thank you. So let's take a look at a trial exhibit 1-2125, found at compendium tab 26. And let's look at compendium page uh, 74. And at page 74 in the middle, and with the paragraph starting with between 1880 and 1900, um, starting with that paragraph, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'm going to read from one, two, three, four, six lines up from the bottom. And the author says, these sterling yields, those are the yields that you relied upon, correct? Can you give me a moment? So the context, because it says these yields, I do yes. want to be sure. Uh, these sterling yields is what it says. Okay, please ask your question, sorry. Okay, so the first thing is that the sterling yields being referenced in these paragraphs are the sterling yields between 1900 to 1913 that you say Mr. Hutchings should have relied upon. Yes. The author, thank you, the author says these sterling yields were part, were a part of the history of English interest rates, not of Canadian interest rates. They should not be linked with and compared to later Canadian internal yields as though they formed a continuous history. Until a market developed in 1920 for Dominion internal obligations, 
a history of Canadian bond yields must rely on the yields of internal provincial bonds. You read that? See that? Let me just read that last sentence. Yes? Go ahead. Now, might that be the academic reference that Mr. Hutchings could have relied on for using provincial bonds for 1900 to 1913? He could have misinterpreted those sentences and reached the wrong conclusion, of course. I cannot say. Well, let's, let's go down to the bottom of this page where it says chart 76. I'm going to suggest to you he didn't misconstrue anything that you've made a mistake, not him. Let's try and see if I can have you agree with me on that. Chart 76 pictures the decennial averages of the prov province of Ontario bond yields and the Dominion long-term bond yields. So let's go over to chart 76, which is on the next page, I believe. And if you'll see in this graph, there's, you can see that it's chart 76 in the box. You see that? Yes. That's the decennial averages. And you'll see that there's also a straight line for province of Ontario bonds and a dotted line for Dominion of Canada long-term bonds. Yes. And you'll see that the author uses province of Ontario bonds well into 1935. He maps it, but he does not map the Dominion of Canada long-term bonds until about 1920, as far as I can tell from this graph or chart. Would you agree with me that that's what it depicts? It's difficult to see exactly what's there. I'm gonna quickly refer to the rates. I think, Mr. Schachter, you called it chart 76, but the, in my edition, the charts are on page 75. Um, we're looking at page 70, 75 of the compendium. Okay, thank you. If you're looking for the rates, you'll find them at compendium tab 76. So this is chart 78. No, it's chart 76. Sorry, I have page 75. So page 75 of the compendium, the first chart is chart 76. Chart 76 is described by the author as the decennial oh, averages see. of the province of Ontario bond yields and the Dominion long-term bond yields. Thank you. So would you agree with me that the author does not chart Dominion of Canada long-term bonds prior to around uh, 1920 or thereabouts. Yes, that's right. Because in this case, he is trying to describe markets in North America. That's what this section of his book is about. Canada in and Ontario in the 20th century, particularly after World War I, started to issue more of their bonds in New York. And now there was even a Canadian market where they were issued prior to World War I. When Canadian governments issued, they almost always issued in London. Here, the book is not called 
the cost of capital in Canada. It's called a history of interest rates. Here, he's trying to describe interest rates in North American markets. Would you agree with me, sir, that the, uh, 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 instead of Mr. Hutchings misunderstanding anything, that you and that he refers to one section of the of the book in support of his opinion and you're referring to a different section and it's a difference of opinion. Can we say that? Well, perhaps I was wrong to suggest that I could understand what Mr. Hutchings was thinking and what motivated him to use Ontario bond rates when Canadian bond rates were available. That is when I say Canadian, of course, I mean bond rates on Canada's government of Canada. You do agree, I hope, that in this text, or in, sorry, in this book, excuse me, there is a rationale for using Ontario yields prior to 1920. You might not agree with it. You might think Mr. Hutchins shouldn't have relied on it, but that's what it says. Would you agree with that? There's a rationale in that chapter, which was concerned with North American markets, but Canada's traded in London at that time. Therefore, they're not discussed in this chapter. So that's, there's a difference of opinion between you and Mr. Hutchings about what's, what the appropriate bond rate should be. Can we leave it at that? I would prefer to leave it at saying there were Canada's in the period 1900 to 1913 and they must be used if one wishes to capture the rate of return on Canada's. And when you use the word Canada's, you're saying long-term bond rates? Government of Canada long-term bonds. Thank you. Would you agree with me that an investor in 1900 would want to, if they're investing in bonds, would want to invest in the safest and securest bond available? Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. If you're an investor in bonds in 1900 and you have a choice to buy a bond that's more secure than the other, which one are you gonna choose? It depends on their yields. People are always willing to accept risk if the average return to that risky asset is high enough. And so riskier bonds tend to have higher average yields to compensate. Well, they might, but not in this case, because let the section you relied on, sir, and I'll, um, says, and it's right at page 79 of the compendium, it's also repeated at slide 112 at the second line of page 79. The credit of the Dominion itself has rested more on the economy of Ontario than has the credit of the government of the United States rested upon the economy of any one state. And I'm suggesting to you that in a, I don't know if it was a quirk of the economy at the time between 1900 and 1913, but buying bonds from Ontario was more secure than buying bonds from Canada. Would you agree with that? No, I don't agree. Okay. I think we can move along. In your, well, let's go to your, um, it is uh, 1045, how, how are we doing? Yeah, okay. Um, implications of higher interest rates, slides 107 to 108. Now, in this part of your slides and in your testimony, um, you talk about and, and, and you say 
you use the expression a high rate, high interest rates. Now that, that I, I understand that the rate that Mr. S Professor Stiglitz and Mr. Hutchings use is higher than yours, but <clears throat> do you mean to say that in a pejorative way that it's the rate they use, which averages 7.2% is high or just higher than yours? They're very high, and those rates are depicted on slide 107 to which you just called my attention. Those are the rates of interest that they use. Do you understand that they average 7.2% over time? You're talking about the annual average yes. rate of interest. Yes. I'm talking about the rate of interest over the longer period of time that's relevant in this case. And it's important to make that distinction. There's no presumption that rate of interest means annual. And because of the compounding, just the mathematics of compounding, yes. annual rates of interest are known to be deceptive. And my purpose on this slide was to use the actual rates of interest over the relevant years to, to display them, precisely because of this concern that non-economists unfamiliar with what sometimes called the magic of compound interest, would think 6%, 7%, what's the difference? This slide is meant to illustrate the actual rates of interest over the relevant period of time, rather than your annual rates, which are not what we use. These are what we use if we well, use the Hutchings approach. You, you, yeah, you use it, but I'm asking you whether a 7.2% annual rate of return is too high. Yes, it is. And would you agree with me that, that an annual rate of return of 7.2% is expressed as a nominal rate of return? Yes. And it's not a real rate of return? Yes. And um, would you agree with me that it's the real rate of return that matters to an investor? It depends on the context. Well, if there's inflation, that eats into your nominal rate of return, correct? Yes. Now, I want you to assume with me something. We're gonna to go to a hypothetical. And I know you economists can do that. And I want you to assume with me for a moment, that there was no persistent long-term inflation until approximately World War I. Could you assume that? Possibly counterfactually, sure. Do you agree that that's accurate? No. Okay. So let's assume that it's true. I'm we're just assuming it for my hypothetical. Now, let's also assume that the average long-term rate of inflation since World War I has been 3.04%. Can we assume that? Since World War I, 3.04%. Okay. Now, I've included from the Bank of Canada inflation calculator at tab 27. Um, I've done that calculation through their model. Can you take a look at that? Sure. Page. Uh, it's compendium page 81 and 82. Yes. And you'll see at page 82, just plugging in the numbers from 1914 to 2023, we get an average annual rate of return of 3.04%. Now, you may or may not have an opinion on this and may or may not know whether you think that's accurate or not. Are you able to opine on whether I'm, the Bank of Canada calculator, inflation calculator might be very close to an answer you would be comfortable with? It's pretty close to the number I would use. Official statistics on CPI, all items used here, begin in 1926. So there's some uncertainty about what to use for 1914 to 25, but this is close enough to what I would use. Okay. 
So an average real rate of return, if one had a nominal rate of return of 7.2 and the average of inflation was 3.04 from 1914, you're looking at a rate of re a real rate of return of less than 4%. Would you agree with that? Again, are you doing annual average? Yeah, I'm, just, of I'm, I'm going annual average to average, annual average to annual average. 7%, uh, seven percent minus three percent. Sorry, one at a time. I'm, I'm, I'm. The math I'm doing is seven point two percent minus three point zero four percent to try and get a sense of the annual real rate of return from nineteen fourteen to the present. Would you agree with me that? it would make sense to say that the real rate of return is under 4% on average. 7.2 minus 3.04 would be 4.16, oh, just sorry. over 4%. Just over 4%, my, my, my apologies. Yeah, sorry. Um, so it's just over 4% um, is, a 4.16% real rate of return too high? That's a real rate of return. Yes. And I don't know in what context you would say too high or too low. Um, oh, oh, well, oh, yeah, I, that's, that's, I apologize for asking the question in that way. Let me give you another assumption. Suppose the crown and the initial, I want you to assume that the crown in the Anishinaabe in 1850 had the shared belief that the real rate of return to them for the future would be 5%. If they had that belief and expectation, would a real rate of return be of 4.16 be too high? You're asking me to opine on too high in, in a context which is different than, one, than the one in which I made this statement. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And it's so, hypothetical. So would 4% be too high to describe a set of people who expected 5%? Well, from their perspective, it would not be too high. Thank for you. Sure. I want to discuss with you the expectations of the parties in 1850. Um, are, have you looked to see what the party's expectations were in 1850 as to what rate of return they might expect in 1850? I'm aware of some discussion of that at stage one. It's not relevant to the calculations we did, so I haven't reviewed it. Okay. Maybe we can leave it at that then. Um, let's turn then, uh, now would be a good time to break actually. Thank you.